remember that the idea of lasso is to minimize a residual sum of the squares error, that is, become, find a most accurate model, under some constraint on the L1 complexity of the model. We've already had two ways to think about this. The first is that you can imagine specifying an L1 limit, and then within that convex set, trying to minimize the L2 norm, which probably ends you right about, uh, right about there at the top corner. On the other hand, one can think about both the residual sum of squares quadratic error and the L1 norm as playing off of each other. And you can imagine balancing which one is more important. And for each choice of parameter t, which is the relative importance of these two functions, you can find some sort of combined minimum, perhaps right there, depending on what t is. In some sense, the goal of the lasso Large algorithm is to compute the trajectory of all of these joint optimal models, but without having to solve an optimization problem at every step. You can imagine a naive way to do this. You fix a parameter t and use a Newton's method or something similar to solve the minimization problem, and then you adjust t and try again. That's extremely inefficient computationally and very, very time consuming. The Lars Lasso algorithm offers a better way. My main reference for the Lars algorithm is in the book Elements of Statistical Learning by Tibershani Casti et al. So here's the algorithm as we'll use it. I'm going to change the letters a little bit to match what I have on the other slides. So first of all, we have to begin with all of our predictor variables x having equal weight in some sense. So we're going to start off by normalizing our data. This is a good idea for many machine learning algorithms because say, if you have two different measurements of say length and width in different columns of your data, maybe length is measured in inches and width is measured in meters. You don't want the artificial weighting, the artificial, the numbers to seem artificially large for one versus the other. If one, if one column is in inches and the other is in feet, there's a multiple of 12 there, which would make one variable seem artificially 12 times as important. So you always want to begin by centering and normalizing your data so that it has mean zero and standard deviation one. Again, this is a standard SVD or PCA procedure on each variable. <clears throat> so we're, we'll describe this iteratively like is done in the book, um, and then we'll look at the algorithm overall. So the first thing you want to do is, is look at the residual, which is currently, we're gonna start with a zero model. They call these betas, I would call them Ms personally. But you, you set your model to the zero model, in which case the residual is, of course, the variable y itself, because the model predicts nothing. So we're going to figure out which predictor xj is most correlated with the residual. Of course, what that really means is you take x transpose r and look for the entry that's largest in absolute value. Now what we'll do is we'll adjust the coefficient beta j or mj from zero towards the idealized coefficient in a least squares model using only that variable. Now, if this were a forward stepwise progression, what you would do is simply take that least squares model using that one variable and be done with it. So you're producing the best possible one variable model. That's not what happens in Lars. In Lars, what we do is we only use that variable until some other variable becomes just as good. <clears throat> so, while initially we're moving only in the xj direction, only I should say in the beta j or mj direction in our model, in our space of models, once another competitor variable becomes just as important, we're actually going to stop for a moment. And then we are going to um, compute the, best, the model for both of those, and we're going to move the two coefficients, the original one, beta j or mj, and the new one, beta k or mk, to move them together to change the model in both variables at once. At some point, a third variable will become just as important as those first two. So we will add it to the variables that we're using and move all three of them together in the model until there's a fourth one that's equally good, and so on. Now we'll make some adjustments to this later. There's some details. But overall, that's the idea. And we're going to keep going in this way until we've used all the variables. So why does this make sense? Why don't we use the entire least squares fit 
for the variable x for the first best variable xj and the the best fit for xj and xj together in the second step. <clears throat> Why do we keep only moving them a certain amount until a new variable becomes important? Well, the idea is indicated to us <clears throat> exactly by this picture of what we're trying to do with lasso lars. We are actually trying to find a path in this space, in this case this would be like M1 and M2, we're trying to find a path from the zero model to the most accurate model that is a joint minimizer for the L1 norm and the RSS norm, for the RSS error. So think about the geometry here. We are taking ellipsoids and we are trying to see where they intersect a bunch of cubes. So because of the cursor dimensionality and because of the geometry of the situation and because of things like Lagrange multipliers telling you that joint optima happen when the two surfaces are tangential and have the same normal vector, what this means is that you start off with a single best variable. In this case, you move straight up because on this square, the upper point here is the one that's closest to the minimum here in terms of the RSS error given by these ellipses. So we're going to be using, in this case, only the, let's see, let's call this M1 and let's call this M2. We're going to be moving only in the M2 direction for a while. But then something happens right about here. Notice at this point, the two level sets are tangent suddenly. Instead of just crossing transversely, they're suddenly tangent. So now that means that we've reached a point where it's as beneficial, it's actually more beneficial to move diagonally in both variables M1 and M2 than it is to move simply in M2. So in a, in a forward stepwise progression, you would move straight up all the way and then straight over all the way. But in Lars, you move up until the two level sets become tangent. And then you move them together. That is, you move them in some distorted version of the space at a 45 degree angle. I say distorted, of course, because we're adjusting the residual as we go, and we've normalized our variables in various ways. But the idea here is that if you're trying to optimize on the surface of a cube, in this case, you know, it's a it's a diagonal cube whose corners are the are the fundamental axes, are the coordinate axes. Well, most of the time you'll be moving along in only one direction along the corner. But when that changes, you're guaranteed to be moving perpendicular to a face. And perpendicular to a face means move at a 45 degree angle. In a high dimensional version of this picture, first you're moving along a corner, and then you're moving along an edge, and then you're moving along a two dimensional face. So that's first you use one variable, and then you use two variables equally, and then you use a third variable, and you use those three equally, and so on. So you're always moving to a higher and higher dimensional face in such a way that you're moving at a 45 degree angle in the scaled version of the space of models. So this is inherent to the way that Lagrange multipliers work, right? If you're jointly optimizing these two and you don't happen to be on a corner, then you must be on a face or an edge. And the level sets must be tangential. So if you're tangential to an L1 level set, then you're moving at a 45 degree angle. That fundamental geometry is the reason for this idea of move only until some other competitor has as much correlation. So you move along an axis direction until some edge of that high dimensional cube um, becomes tangent. And then we move along that tangent edge until some third component, which then would give us a face in a high dimensional cube, a two dimensional face, uh, becomes equally important. We move along that face for a while and so on. So in this way we're building our model variable by variable but in such a way that we're respecting the balance of the L1 norm and the L2 norm. Now there's one addition to make, which turns the least angle regression into the lasso algorithm. I'll scroll down a few pages here in the book. It's algorithm 3.2a. If in this process a non-zero coefficient hits zero, we drop its variable from the list of variables that we're using and recompute and begin, and begin from there. The reason for this is that occasionally you'll be moving along an edge of this high dimensional cube or a face, and as you follow that trajectory, you actually end up running off the other edge. So now you say is, okay, if, if for a while a variable, say variable k was important, but suddenly it's not important anymore, then what we should do is we should no longer consider ourselves moving in the 
higher dimensional space, we should ignore that variable and go back to a lower dimensional space. That actually ends up being a very useful thing to do, um, and it helps us deal with this case where, in the picture, you could imagine a situation where, for a while, you're moving along um, this edge here, but you start off maybe moving up, but then you're moving sideways, and then eventually you're only moving this direction. So if it turns out that for a while only M2 is important, and then M1 and M2 are jointly important, and then only M1 is important and M2 is no longer relevant, we should sort of stop playing with M2 for a while until it becomes important again. So what we're really doing is we're making a trajectory that's traveling around the vertices, edges, faces, and so on of a growing high-dimensional L1 sphere that is a high-dimensional cube. It's a very clever algorithm. Because it respects the geometry of the intuitive picture we're trying to do, so solving a family of energy minimization problems. But the way the algorithm is constructed looks nothing like a minimization on its face. It's really about understanding what the trajectory must look like geometrically. Okay, in the next video, we'll talk about some details of the algorithm and how to keep track of things.